Welcome back to ArtofDino.com, and we are going to continue to question the narrative of some periodical newspapers from the Library of Cons. And so I found a few articles, some I posted in the community section, some I have not. I'm going to read them, and uh, most of them, and then elaborate on what I think they mean and what other things are uh, kind of encompassing them. And so they are all kind of loaded. I picked some interesting ones that'll make you think. So uh, here we go. Let's dive right in. So the first one is from New York, December 16th. I forget what years. I think this is like 1870s or something. I, most of them I can remember the years, but some I can't. But this one says, this is just kind of a good opener. It says, the stupendous monuments of antiquity, which excite the admiration of modern times, ought at the same time to fill our hearts with gratitude to heaven for amending the condition of mankind in such manner that a few haughty despots do not command the wealth of the world and the labor of millions of slaves, by which means only such astonishing works could have been erected. And I'll stop there and say that <clears throat> despots, haughty despots still do command the wealth of the world in the labor of millions of slaves. They just don't call us slaves now. They call us employees and workers. But continuing on, it says, how much better is it to employ the wealth of this world in forming institutions for promoting useful knowledge and lessening the infelicities of existence than to suffer human vanity to erect monuments of pride and ambition which stamp indelible infamy on the degraded character of the age in which they are founded. It almost sounds like an evolved version of like the, the, the stuff now where they look back at the, the, the past as the patriarchy and all this other nonsense that it's just, you know, it just swaying the minds of the readers to convince them that they are the best, that the past was terrible, that everything they told you about the past is exactly true, primitive to now, constant evolution, nothing high-tech ever, nothing ever, just you're, you're, you should be so happy now that you're not a slave like they were back in the day, put into work making beautiful buildings which we can't make anymore and all this stuff. So again, newspapers, boom, they were the mind control method of the reset and so you will see why in a lot of these so let's continue on here we go this article says 600 years ago the grand khan of tartary in 1257 had his paper money made of fibers of mulberry bark the inner part of it this was steeped in the water and pounded in mortars reduced to pulp like some made forgotten something but it was quite black this paper was cut into pieces nearly square but somewhat oblong these bore the value from lowest to highest to a venetian sequin about 250 back in this time a number of officers signed and sealed each of these bills and lastly the principal officer appointed by his majesty the khan having dipped into vermilion the royal seal stamped each note this gave it authenticity and it was death to counterfeit it the khan was solicited by catholic jesuits to become a christian Listen to this. He took pains to study the Christian system, said it was admirable, taught nothing, but was good. But his people were accustomed to the miraculous power of the priests of their reason, who continually exhibited supernatural power. As for instance, they caused the dishes and vessels of liquid on his own table to come to his hands magically, without hands, etc., and that unless the Christian could do as much, he feared that his people would not listen to the good things of the Christian religion. So think about this. This is several articles where I've heard them refer to the uh, Celestials or the Tartarians or the Asians and people under the Khan as having the ability through their religion and spiritual practices to have exhibit supernatural powers, moving things, levitating things. I've heard several stories of this and I will dig up the other articles that I found and compile them together as well. But I find this very interesting because Again, if this world and this realm was once run by people with supernatural magical powers who could do things that make the buildings that we see left over from antiquity, they could do these things. They could power them. They could do so much. They could move buildings. They could make massive structures. They could move obelisks. They could do anything, boats, uh, airships, anything could happen with this magic. And then it seems like the Christianity came in and stifled the magic. And this guy says he feared that his people would not listen to the good things of Christian religion. So it's not just the Khan that has these magical powers. There are many. The uh, genies, all these other things you hear about from that time era. I think it's more real than we can ever possibly fathom. And I think when the reset happened, they sucked the magic and beauty and 
the magical abilities of our humanity and our minds and bodies and spirits out intentionally to make this place planned and terrible so that the new religion could be money and a lot of other things. So uh, who knows? I'd like to hear what you think, but let's keep going. This article is about the Loomis Aerial Telegraph. And I remember this was about the 1870s. So it says, a bill incorporating the Loomis Aerial Telegraph Company was recently passed by Congress. This aerial telegraph scheme is a novel thing. The plan of Dr. Loomis, who I'm definitely going to further look up, the inventor, is to telegraph from a high point of the Rocky Mountains to the highest attainable peak of the Alps, at which point a tower is to be erected, on the top of which a huge mast is to be placed. An apparatus capable of collecting electricity is to be put upon the upper end of this mast, by means of which at such elevation it is claimed that a strata of the atmosphere will be reached which is charged with electricity. I kind of firmly believe that, and I think that's one thing that they've eradicated from our science cult. Ground connection, the same as is used in ordinary telegraphy, will be erected. This electrified strata of the atmosphere will, as with the ordinary single wire and ground connection, make a complete circuit, and it is claimed that the slightest pulsation of electricity at one tower will produce similar pulsation at the other. The company is to have a capital stock of $200,000 with the privilege of increasing it to two Two millions if the interest of the company shall require it. The business and objects of the corporation are stated in the bill to be developed and utilize the principles and power of natural electricity to be used in telegraphing, generating light, heat, and motive power, and otherwise, and operate any machinery run by electricity for any purpose. So again, was this technology similar to uh, the ether and did it get completely lost and stolen? Did Congress attain it so that they could bury it? I'm beginning to think so. And also, if this guy in this tech, you know, A, the part of the stratosphere that is run by electricity, that might explain something about the airplanes and their power that we, because uh, we're being duped on how that whole process works. But also, if this guy believed that, how can you do that on a spherical earth? How could it go from one tower in America all the way to the Alps and uh, be uh, with all the round sphericalness? That would be so all on the other side almost. So again, pointing towards the science of a flat earth and it being known to the scientists of all time besides the ones who are involved in the education of the masses. Employees. Slaves. Here we go. Let's keep going. And here's an advertisement of P.T. Barnum's greatest show on earth in the 1870s. Monday, September 15th, greater than ever, the most magnificent and attractive, all the new attractions for 1879, revised with the wildest delight everywhere. The best show in the universe, nearly 2 million invested in this gigantic combination of museum menagerie, mechanical wonders, and circus company of 100 new rare attractions, coal black dromedaries, milk white camels, two horned rhinoceros, largest horns of elephant, endless to this, the troop of royal stallions. The most beautiful and intelligent animals ever seen are 20 in number and were imported at a cost of 150,000 from their royal masters, the emperors of Russia and Germany, the late Victor Emmanuel, king of Italy, and the Grand Khan of Tartary. They appear under the direction of their trainer, Carl Anthony Jr., at each performance, and wow. So they in order to find the best animals, the most trainable, the most intelligent animals, they went to Russia and Tartary. And I find this very interesting too, because as animals get more and more intelligent, it's almost as if they came from another part of the world. And the ones that are here and in America were just kind of inferior in this aspect of being able to be untrained. It's almost as if for thousands of years, the Khans and the Tartarians and, the, and whoever were doing this and keeping this tradition alive. So it's almost as if it's an old world tradition of preserving and strengthening your animals that are, are around, utilizing them to your advantage for various reasons and doing all different kinds of things. And so these guys, again, had this old world tradition at the best of the abilities of anyone in the world and so P.T. Barnum knew that and went right to them. I find that very interesting and just again how just the Grand Khan of Tartary was just it's known you know it was in all these papers at this time but then at some point it became erased it became shunned it became like the Hitler of, of modern era where you just it becomes a blasphemous word it seems like and so um 
don't know how that happened or when it happened, but again, everyone was a fan of the Tartarians. They were equivalent of Egypt and all this stuff, except they were probably closer to the time. I don't think anyone in the 1800s had a connection to ancient Egypt, but I think they did to Tartary in that time. So that is, a, is one of the other kind of takeaways from a lot of this, but let's keep going. And this one's a long one, but I'm only gonna read uh, the beginning of it. It says, initial facts in our history. Our children are taught French, moral solace in cubic sections and read histories of Greece and Rome. How few of them and how few men and women know anything of the history of their own country, except an outline or a few detached facts. Boy, is that true. Every single generation. How few undergraduates know that Columbus undertook his first voyage in the expectation of finding the Grand Khan of Tartary. That he set sail on Friday of 1492, that unlucky and direful day, and on Friday, ten weeks after, discovered land. That he supposed Cuba to be the continent, that he first reached the continent on the north coast of South America six years afterwards, that upon his fourth and last voyage he founded the first colony on the mainland on the Isthmus of Panama, that 21 years after the first discovery the old world was astonished to find they had discovered a new world when they reached the Pacific across the Isthmus, but that Cabot, an Englishman, reached the shores of New England a full year before Columbus touched the continent, that saying Augustine, Florida is the oldest town in America, being just 300 years old, that Santa Fe, New Mexico is the second town in point of age, that 20 years later, 1602, California was discovered and explored, that in 1603, a Frenchman, Sir de Monte, made the first permanent settlement north of San Augustine at Annapolis, and twice attempted a settlement on Cape Cod, but was driven off by the Natums, that Champlain founded Quebec in 1608, that our coast from Pennsylvania to New Brunswick was named Acadie, like Acadia in Maine, afterward, New France, that Canada formerly comprehended our Vermont in New York, that Virginia was so named by Walter Raleigh in honor of Queen Elizabeth 1584 when he made his exploration of the North Carolina coast, that the first English child born in America was Virginia Dare, daughter of Axanius that the projected colony failed, that Jamestown was the first English town in America, begun 1607 and named for King James I, that the want of wives in Virginia was so great that in 1621 a large number of young women of good character were transported to the colony on speculation and sold to the lonely settlers for 120 to 150 pounds of tobacco each. <laughs> to suggest that a certain governor borrow a hint thereby. <laughs> that New England was so named by John Smith, 1614, that at length a settlement was made without a grant from the King's Council at New Plymouth and sent its roots deep and wide into the scanty soil by a, heart, by a hand of 102 passengers, December of 1620, who came in a small craft whose name has been spoken from the accident to the or Occident to the Orient to wit the Mayflower. So, wow, that is a ton packaged into that, and I don't even know where to begin. So, <laughs> just read that over again and take a listen. And again, who knows if this guy's telling the truth? I think, again, that there was a civilization in America long before, and this is, again, even this guy trying to pretend that he's not spouting corrupt history is indeed spouting corrupt history and uh, one day we'll know the ultimate truth but until then let's just we gotta take and sift through the junk and this one i found interesting because it's a talk in congress and it mentions something cool that i may have mistook the wrong way at one point but i'm not sure it's kind of confusing especially when you don't really know uh, the context completely but it says uh the third class was honest was mistaken perhaps the senator from wisconsin pitied these good people it is quite evident that he looked upon them as very impel-minded, for he at once proceeds in his remarkable effort to bring forward his first class of silver advocates, the mine owners, as the very goblins of the financial tale he tells to fright their fearful souls. The mine owners are largely responsible for the silver agitation. The mine owners make large profits on a comparatively small outlay. The mine owners employ the keenest and best trained intellects to fight the battle for silver. The mine owners seek to secure the best price for silver. He represented the people of the Rocky Mountains as subservient to the mine owners, then added, the ver quote unquote, the veriest despot of story, the Grand Khan of Tartary, the great mogul, never had more submissive subjects than the silver king of the Rockies, nor was 
ever tyrant more piteously exacting. No independence of thought or speech is tolerated there. No party, no creed, no business can thrive which dares to doubt in the realms of that monarch, the law of finance as it is in silver. The businessmen find it prudent to say nothing, and as for the politician who dares to flaunt his independence, woe be to him. So what is this that it's unveiling? Is this like an early American uh, 1800s and whatnot dominance of politicians by the silver industry? And how did the silver industry end up going? Because we know how a lot of businesses like oil industries ended up continuously dominating. Who are the heirs to this silver industry that they are comparing to the Grand Khan of Tartary? Saying that, you know, they know that the power of the Khan and they're saying that what the silver um, king of the Rocky Mountains is doing is even more vicious and uh, despot despotic than that. So what was happening in the Rocky Mountains and when was this happening and if the mines you know if if there was an extreme mining uh, industry and whatnot is that partially what left the Rockies looking the way they do all kind of torn up and destroyed and mangled and again so much happened before I think the papers came in and the controllers were just romping around this world doing whatever they can setting up things so that industries of slavery again of all the of all types could form and the, the the history could be controlled completely it just seems like there's so much that we're not being told so much that's not or that has been lost and so much again that politicians keep from people politicians almost seem to serve as the people who uh, are the gatekeepers of information if they don't want something or some influence being to be known or some person they they, they hide it they never tell who's uh, pulling their strings ever it's their most biggest kept secret and it has been throughout time and the reasons why their strings um, are able to be pulled is because they're a lot of times very pathetic and they do anything for money and to gain more power and control and that's the system that breeds the insanity that brings us to the modern uh, disgust of American politics and probably worldly politics as well because everywhere is a mess but again the Rocky Mountains what the heck happened there was I kind of believe that it was once an ancient 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 civilization that just got mangled and if they were mining it maybe they were just raiding it and destroying things crashing things crushing things opening caverns opening buildings opening mountains doing whatever to find what they could and extract it off realm but that's just a theory Here's a small but interesting one that says the Moravians have a much greater hatred for the Russians and friendship for us than the inhabitants of Austria. The Moravians are astonished to see in the midst of their immense plains the people of the Ukraine, of Kamshaka, of Grand Tartary, and the Normans, the Gascones, the Britons, and the Burgundians ready to cut each other's throats without the country having anything in common or the least immediate political interest. They have the good sense to say in their bad bohemian that human blood is become in the hands of the English an article of merchandise. Again, I, 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 I'm showing this because it is the theme of all of this. Really, that these people, these, these old world people didn't have that mentality. They would never look at human blood as the is as merchandise a new article of merchandise but that when the reset came when the nonsense came when the controllers took seized power here of this realm that is what it became in the the old worlders noticed immediately because it's such an alien concept it's sickening to them it's still sickening to us now that's why it almost seems like people are aliens and npcs because they can do this kind of stuff without any remorse and that is a weird and not of the ancient ways the ancient ways must have been better and superior in all ways to this english nonsense that's polluted the globe but here we go one last one so this one is from Saturday, July 27th, 1918, and I like that where it says, And the disease is spreading. Nature does not like wars and murders too long continued. When Europe was always at war, the plague was always in Europe. From smallpox that killed its tens of thousands every year to the Black Death that traveled eastward from Tartary to Genoa, as this plague in Russia is traveling eastward and killed more than half of all the people of Europe, three quarters of all the people in England. That Black Death which old Russian chronicles 
say started in China, came creeping slowly, irresistibly across Europe in the 14th century. All the bloody Kaisers rolled into one are feeble murderers compared with Asia's plague. When it gets going, one single epidemic killed more than 25 millions of human beings. When this hideous unavoidable death that follows war and famine as the ferret follows a rat begins its travels in Germany, you may hear a real peace suggestion before the American flying machines arrive to force it. So wow, boy is that packed. And that might as well say 2023 because again, the same exact stuff. They just constantly learn from the past uh, their methods of control, especially when they're as good as something like a plague and you can kill all these people so quickly and blame it on something invisible. It's, it's astounding. You could do it, it, especially back in the day when they didn't have cameras anywhere, they must have been able to get away with this so easily. You could eviscerate an entire land, an entire people, an entire civilization and blame it on a disease and no one would have any clue. They'd just read about it in a paper and that would be the end of it. History is constantly being erased and rewritten to suit those who inevitably profit the most and control the most and have the most power and search for the most power and do anything to get it. So again, we must be on our toes because they continuously try the same things. We have to learn from the past, we have to stop this flow, and we have to bring the old world mentality back. And one way of doing that is restoring our history and giving us our true power and purpose so that we can fight and win, and we will. So stay tuned for more. Bless you all.